Well, we now come to the preaching of God's word, and we're going to be in John chapter 12, verses 12 to 26. I want to begin our time by going ahead and reading this portion of scripture, John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. Then these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and began to ask him saying, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am there, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. As we come to the end of this portion of scripture that we just read, we find some fitting and timely words from the lips of our Lord. The cost to follow him is increasing. The world is trying harder and harder to press us into its mold. And as time goes on, it will become more and more difficult to remain faithful to him. There are threats of job loss. There are threats of not being able to buy or sell, and even the threat of being totally removed from society. And as a result of that, all of our Lord's difficult teaching about the cost of discipleship, all of his difficult teaching of what it means to follow after him seems far less theoretical, far more applicable, and yes, even far more practical. And so at a critical moment in the providence of God, we are confronted with what it means to follow Christ. And the context is helpful in that it yields a stunning contrast because as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he is heralded as king by the masses just a few days from his own crucifixion. How can they herald him as king in one moment and then call for his crucifixion in the next because their praise is superficial? It's conditioned on an inaccurate notion about his coming. They think he's coming to save by establishing the promised kingdom. Instead, he's going to save by laying down his life for the forgiveness of sin. They want kingdom glory but they have no interest in personal repentance. And so a person can shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But that means nothing if you don't hate your life. And it means nothing if your life isn't marked by obedience. It's just empty, fickle, and superficial praise. And so as we come, to this passage, we want it to serve really three functions. One, we want it to test the integrity of your faith. Is your faith superficial or is it the real thing? 
two, we wanted to sharpen the, the, the understanding that we have of the cost of discipleship. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What does it mean to follow after him? And three, we want it to strengthen us for the road ahead. You see, by exposing ourselves to the cost of discipleship, it will bring meaning and purpose to our suffering. We will understand why it is that we must go through what we will go through. And may it strengthen our resolve to stand firm. And so what are we gonna see? We're going to see the superficial, then the savior, and then third and last, the sincere. And so if you're taking notes, jot this down, the superficial. The superficial, this comes out in verse 12 and following. It says there, on the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him. Now we're less than a week away from the crucifixion of Christ. We're in what they often call Passion Week. And John notes that this event took place on the next day. So this is the day following the supper where Mary anointed the feet of Jesus. And the last time I said this event took place on Palm Sunday, it may have in fact been Monday as you try and work through the way the, the, the Jews reckon days from sunset to sunset. It's possible that this is actually Palm Monday and though we're not going to flesh out a, a strict chronology of the events at this point in time, we may as we continue to work through John's gospel. But suffice it to say at this point in time, it is the next day. And as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, the crowd gets word, takes palm branches in hand and comes out to meet him. Palm branches were a sign of celebration. They're typically connected with the Feast of Tabernacles, but became very custom for all of the feasts, the feasts of Passover and dedication. And this was an incredibly large crowd. This was thousands upon thousands. Big numbers have been estimated to, to depict the number of people that would have been in Jerusalem at this time, but it's really thousands upon thousands. They have made the, the pilgrimage to Jerusalem for this feast. They have heard that Jesus had ri risen Lazarus from the dead. And so now these thousands upon thousands come out of Jerusalem to meet Jesus on the way and to herald him as king. The middle of verse 13 indicates they began to shout. And this depicts a, a loud cry. This is a, a, an intensely loud shout as they begin to shout. Middle of verse 13 again, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is a, a shout of praise, but it literally means help or save, I pray. So as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, there are thousands upon thousands that are crying out to him, save, I pray, help, I pray. In fact, they're citing Psalm 118.25, which says this, O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. That's the, the verse right before the very next verse, which declares, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And so they are, they are citing a, a psalm as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, heralding him to save them, to deliver them, shouting with a, a loud cry, thousands upon thousands. And they're doing so in anticipation that Jesus is the promised Davidic king, that he's going to come and establish his throne and, and overthrow Israel's enemies. Look at that, end of verse 13. Even the king of Israel, they believe this is it. They believe that this is the time, that this is the time for the, the promised one to arrive and to establish all of the, the promises of the old covenant. They believe Jesus is going to assume David's throne and overthrow Rome and allow times of blessing and prosperity to come. There is kingly anticipation in the air. 
And really it's so ironic. They are seeing Jesus come. They are meeting him with palm branches. Thousands upon thousands are, are crying out to him. We beseech you, O Lord, do save. And Jesus was going to save but it wouldn't be through any kind of military conquest. Instead, he was coming as the suffering servant to lay down his life for the forgiveness of sin. And so the crowd is crying out for salvation and they need salvation, but they fail to realize the kind of deliverance they really need. They want a, a military conqueror, but what they need is the sin-bearing savior. And that really makes the reference to Psalm 118 all the more ironic. Since it also says this, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That comes in the very same context of blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They fail to realize the prophetic irony of the very Psalm there quoting as Jesus approaches Jerusalem. And Jesus seems to tamp down their military expectations because instead of entering Jerusalem on a, a military war horse, war horse, which he will in Revelation 19, when he comes bolting out of heaven on a white, a white horse. But instead here, he seats himself on a donkey. Verse 14, Jesus finding a young donkey sat on it. As it is written, fear not daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. The apostle John writing by the Holy Spirit connects what's happening here to Zechariah 9, 9. Here's what that says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so that Jesus would, would find a donkey and sit himself upon it was symbolic of both peace and humility. He was approaching Jerusalem humble and on a donkey symbolic of peace. And, and we know that even as he is about to accomplish the work that he is, that to do so, he would humble himself even to the point of death on a cross and that he would establish peace, peace with God for all who would ever believe on his name. And so Jesus is bringing humility, he is bringing peace. It's just not the kind of peace that the crowd is expecting. And so this is an epic scene. It's full of excitement and exhilaration. There is anticipation in the air and yet it's all bathed in confusion because the people don't understand the nature of the Lord's coming. In fact, even the disciples missed some of it. Look at verse 16. These things his disciples did not understand at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. Look, they understood that the people were heralding him as king because he is king. They, they know him to be the Christ. Peter had confessed him to be the Christ, the son of the living God. They, they understood him to be Messiah. They knew he was the Christ. That was not at all in, in confusion. In fact, even just prior to this in, in Luke 19, 11, the disciples supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So even the disciples were somewhat confused about the timing of the arrival of the kingdom. And Jesus gave them a parable to explain that it would be later. There would be a, a gap between his first coming and his second but what they failed to understand was the connection to Zechariah 9.9. And they failed to grasp the prophetic power of Psalm 118. Because after declaring 
The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Psalm 118 says this, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And so it'd be in hindsight after Christ is glorified that the disciples would realize that the builders rejected the cornerstone and that they were the ones who would now understand that Jesus is the very one that was promised. He is the chief cornerstone and it's marvelous in their eyes as they look at Israel's rejection of him. His rejection was ultimately predetermined. Psalm 118 declares it. Verse 17, so the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. For this reason, all the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. Again, it's so important to understand that when you read even the synoptics, the the catalyst for the triumphal entry is the raising of Lazarus. That was the miracle of all miracles that that sped up the timeline for the, the, the the Jewish leaders to put Jesus to death. And really it's difficult to fathom how this massive crowd could go so quickly from hailing Jesus as King to calling for his crucifixion. I mean, we're just days away from them saying, crucify him, crucify him. This was a fickle crowd and their fickleness is intensely instructive. In their case, they didn't wanna miss out on the arrival of the kingdom. And so they positioned themselves to be on its receiving end. And then when things didn't quite unfold the way that they were hoping they might, they ultimately rejected him and turned their back on him, even though there was clear evidence that God had sent him, the raising of Lazarus being that obvious evidence. And really there are people that are just like that today. They they make a profession of faith, but it's ultimately conditioned on whether doing so improves their life or not whether or not Jesus meets their expectations. It's almost superstitious that if we, if we confess Jesus as Lord, that maybe our lives will begin to come to fruition the way that we want them to. That is a fickle profession of faith. There are even others who merely want Christ for his benefits. They want the forgiveness of sin. They want life after death. They want to avoid eternal hell, but they don't desire the king himself. There's no love for the king, only a desire to inherit the benefits of being found in him. And so they position themselves to have a share in his benefits without ever really committing themselves to him. They they may come to church, they claim to be a Christian, but it's all just in case just in case this actually proves to be true. In both cases, what you have is a fickle heart and the fickle have no share in the Lord Jesus Christ and will be severely disappointed when they stand before him. As we'll see in a moment, Real saving faith manifests itself in costly commitment to Christ, the kind of commitment that is the direct result of a new birth, regeneration. And so we can see the the superficial, fickle crowd heralding Jesus as king, wanting a merely political kingdom, failing to realize the purpose of his first coming. Second, if you're taking notes, jot this down, the savior, the savior. This comes out in verse 19 and following. It says there, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. This is hyperbole. This is a a frustrated exaggeration. They're looking at what's happening with Jesus, the way the people are responding to him. And they're, they're frustrated. The whole world is going after him. And really it was premature at this point in time to say that. The, 
Those who were there at the feast were predominantly Jews. They would have been Jews who had traveled to Jerusalem for the feast itself. They would have identified as having been Jews. So this wasn't a, a world scale event. And yet it's almost prophetic because in the very next verse, members of the world are mentioned. Look at verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These were Gentiles. We might call them God fears. And they want to see Jesus. Verse 21, then these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began, at, began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. This is significant. Gentiles were beginning to seek Jesus out. And this is foreshadowing the gospel going to all the nations, even when the Samaritans back in, in John 4 had, had come to understand Jesus as the Christ, they confessed him as the savior of the world. Verse 22, Philip came and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus and Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. And so this, this coming of the Greeks to Jesus, wanting to seek Jesus out, wanting to see Jesus was a, a turning point in the gospel of John. Up until this point in time, the chorus has been what? His hour had not yet come. His hour had not yet come when the, the, the religious leaders wanted to take him and seize him and kill him. His hour had not yet come. Well, here Jesus declares his hour has come. It is now time for the son of man to be glorified. And by that, he is referring to his death, resurrection and ascension when he will return to the father and will be seated at the father's right hand. And so this is signaling that we have now reached the beginning of the end of his earthly ministry. His hour had come. He was just days away from his death, resurrection and ascension, having accomplished the, the purpose of his first coming. And Jesus employs just an amazing analogy that pictures the effect of his glorification. Verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You understand that, right? Life is birthed out of death. When a when a seed goes into the ground and dies, it brings forth life. And in a similar way, Jesus was going to die and his death was going to result in everlasting life for people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. It's out of what are seemingly the darkest days that God does his most magnificent work. And there is no day darker than that day when the perfect unblemished son of God suffered under the wrath of God for the sin of all who would ever believe on his name. And so it was out of the darkness of that day that the glorious fruit of salvation was secured as Jesus Christ accomplished everything necessary for our salvation. And even this moment right now is another moment for his work to receive the, the, the fruit for which it's due, for the, the reward of the, the reaping of that work to come to fruition. Have you not heard of the suffering savior? That though you be dead in your trespasses and sins, that there is, there is extended to you an offer of eternal life. That though you have sinned and have come short of the glory of God, though you have broken his holy and righteous law, there is, there is forgiveness available to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. That the father sent him into the world to take upon himself human flesh, to even live under the law, obeying it in all respects that he came and declared the truth, declaring the gospel, declaring his death and resurrection, declaring his glorification as the means by which the world will be saved. That he went to the cross and that on that cross, he suffered, bled and died, suffering under the wrath of God for the sin of, of his people. And on that cross, he atoned for that sin. He drank up that wrath in full. He made complete atonement and he died and he rose from the grave and he is now seated at the right hand of God. And now it's offered to you that you would believe on him and receive everlasting life. 
it's through his death of going into the ground like a seed that this new life is birthed, everlasting life for all who would ever believe on his name. And so you ought to believe on him. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. And there's something else I have to point out here. From here, Jesus is going to connect this analogy about his own death to the cost of following him. Following Christ inevitably results in suffering and sacrifice. Indeed, all who desire to live righteously, godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3.12. And when we lay down our lives for Christ and the gospel, we are following in the footsteps of our Lord. And it's through those acts of sacrifice as we lay down our life for his glory and for the gospel to go forth that, that, that God uses our lives to, to bring people to him. It's as we lay down our lives for Christ and the gospel that we participate in his death, reaping its full reward. And you would have to look no further than the last year to see that. We have chosen to follow Christ. We have chosen to obey him, to, to put his glory on display, to, to herald his gospel from the mountaintop. And as a result of what we've done here at Grace Life Church, there are people who have been saved. They've come to a saving knowledge of Christ. The light is shining in the midst of darkness. And it's, it's, it's participating in the, the, the reward of the Lord's work coming to fruition. It's bringing forth fruit, the fruit of everlasting life. As people hear of the Savior, hear of his glory, hear of his, his saving work upon the cross. And so as you stare your own personal suffering in the mirror right now, you have to understand that it's through suffering that God works, that as you are faithful to Christ in the midst of suffering, it's through that that opportunities will arise for you to glorify God and proclaim the gospel that people will be saved and we get to do that congregationally together. We get to, to do this arm in arm, in lockstep with each other, staring all of the, the coming suffering in the face, knowing that as we submit ourselves to that, God is going to use it to glorify his son, that his son would receive the reward for which he's due. And so this is your time to shine. And as you do, as you follow in the footsteps of Christ, you are following in the footsteps of not just him, but a cloud of witnesses who have gone before us throughout the centuries who have laid down their life for Christ and the gospel. That should put courage in your bones. It should give you reason and purpose to suffer. It should help you understand that all of the pressure you're currently experiencing right now, all of the potential loss that you're facing right now in this moment has a purpose and it's to bring honor and glory to Christ. So we've seen the superficial. We've seen the glorious savior. Now third, if you're taking notes, jot this down, keeping with words that begin with S, the sincere, the sincere. Verse 25, he who loves his life loses it. What does it mean to love your life? It's to love your life to such an extent it's too precious to lose. It's to want it for yourself. It's to want to live your life how you see fit. It's to love self-autonomy. It's to love independence. It's to love the prerogative to live your life on your own terms. We could say it like this. It's to love the world. 
It's the love, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life, which is a, a, a life of pride lived independently from God. It's to love self and live for self. It's to love yourself. It's to seek the advancement of self, to seek self-exaltation. It's to make the, the, yourself the center of everything, to, to, to govern all of your life for the benefit of self, the, the building up of self, the building up of your own kingdom. And you can love your life all the way to the grave. You can love your life all the way until your death. Here's the problem though. You're gonna lose it in the life to come. It will cost you your life in eternity. That's what it says. He who, he who loves his life loses it. And so what you fight to, to hold on to now, what you, what you fight to keep in your hand now is gonna be taken away from you later. In contrast, middle of verse 25, he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Now you're thinking, hatred of life. How do I hate my life? We have to understand here, this is idiomatic. Jesus is really setting things up for you to understand that you would, you would hate your life to the, the, to the extent that you would want to live it for Christ, live it for him. It isn't calling for you to hate your life in an absolute sense. It's calling for you to give up your life to have Christ. It's to renounce self-autonomy. It's to renounce independence. It's to renounce the prerogative to live your life on your terms. It's to hate this world, to hate the lust of the eyes, to hate the lust of the flesh, the, the boastful pride of life, is to see the, the folly of the world. And beyond that, to hate your life in this world is to live for the life to come, to live for eternity, to live for the honor and glory of Christ. It's to be willing to lose it all for the sake of Christ, to be willing to suffer the loss of everything for his sake. And notice the promise that if you give up your life in this world, you'll keep it to life eternal. Commit your life to Christ now. Lose your life now. Give your life to him now and you'll gain it back in eternity when it really matters. You'll gain it back infinitely. You'll gain it back everlastingly. And Jesus says this everywhere. He who has found his life will lose it and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it, Matthew 10, 39. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it, Mark 8, 35. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it and whoever loses his life will preserve it, Luke 17, 33. And so this is incredibly counterintuitive. To save your life, you have to lose it. To live, you have to die. The way up is the way down. And then Jesus further clarifies what it means to hate your life in this world. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And this would be better rendered if anyone should serve me. It's what we call a subjunctive, which means it's a step removed from reality. There's a, an uncertainty about whether one will in fact serve Jesus. In effect, it's similar to what Jesus says elsewhere. If anyone wishes to come after me, do you wish to come after Jesus? There's almost a, an invitation in this. Jesus is appealing to his disciples' inclination towards serving him. And the condition of service that must be met is following him. It's a command. He must follow me. You say, well, what does it mean to follow Christ? It means to obey him. Obeying Christ and following Christ are essentially synonymous. To follow Christ is to obey Christ. And so serving Christ means going where he goes, doing what he does, living how he lives. It requires keeping his word. In fact, he'll say later in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obedience is the litmus test of love. 
And so to follow him is gonna call for certain things. There are certain things that Jesus is calling for. What is he calling for? He's calling for self-denial. He's calling for self-sacrifice. He's calling for the pursuit of personal holiness. He's calling for you to put sin to death, to saturate your life with the word of God, to walk by the spirit, to bear the fruit of the spirit. He's calling you to be devoted to prayer. He's calling for total commitment. He's calling for you to prioritize Christ above everything. He's calling for you to seek his honor and his glory. He's calling you to say with the apostle Paul, to live as Christ and to die as what? Gain. That's what it means to serve and follow Christ. And notice the promise. Middle of verse 26. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Does that sound familiar? It should. Can you think of a passage in John where Jesus uses similar language? Look at John 14. Verses one to three. He's with his disciples, he's in the upper room. And he says to them, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. I mean, this is a wonderful promise that if you're in Christ, he's prepared a place for you in the Father's house. And that when he returns, he's gonna receive you to himself, that you will be where he is also. And so this is a wonderful promise. And where else would you rather be than with Christ? He's the pearl of great price. But note, there's another promise. Look at the end of verse 26. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. What a promise. That if you serve Christ, by following him in obedience, then God the Father will honor you. Can you think of anyone that you would rather be honored by? I mean, he is the the sovereign one over all things. He's the one who spoke all things into existence through the Son. And the promise here is that if you serve Christ, he will honor you. What does that say? It says two things. One, the father deeply loves the son. Deeply loves the son. And two, the father takes great delight in those who honor him. The father loves it when his children honor the son and obey the Son, and follow the Son, and make much of the Son. And so what a promise that the Father will honor you. And so we can sense that the cost is increasing, can't we? The cost to follow Christ is on the rise you may suffer the loss of all things. You may lose your job. You may lose your home. You may lose your family. You may be imprisoned. You may lose everything. And even aside from the benefits that come with believing on Christ, put aside for a moment the forgiveness of sin, reconciliation with God, put aside the the hope of eternal life. In the gospel, you get Christ. Christ is worthy, is he not? 
Is there anyone that compares to him? Is there anything that compares to him? To have Christ is to have everything. And so they can take away everything in this temporal life, but you have all that you need for this life and the life to come already because if you have Christ, you have all things. Jesus on his own is compelling enough, isn't he? And not only do we get him, but even as Ephesians 1.3 says, we are blessed with all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in him. He would be enough. And yet we receive every spiritual blessing there is as the father honors those who honor his son. And so you just have a, a stunning contrast between the superficial who want to herald Jesus for his benefits, are anticipating the, the coming kingdom and want to share in that kingdom. And yet when push comes to shove, they reject him and walk away from him with the sincere. Those who give up their lives, lay their lives down, are willing to lose everything to follow Christ, are willing to lose everything to bring honor and glory to his name. And really we're entering times when the superficial are gonna fall away, proving they were never in Christ to begin with. So many Christians, if they haven't already, are gonna walk away. They're gonna fall away because the cost to follow Christ is too great and the perceived benefits of this life aren't coming close to the cost. It's what Peter describes in 1 Peter 4, 17, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. The household of God is experiencing judgment right now. And if it begins with us first, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? It will be much worse. And so we need to remember the Savior to keep our eyes on the Savior, to follow in the Savior's footsteps. And then after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all peace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Amen? Let's pray together.